Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Hi everyone, I'm Natasha Williams. And I'm Andre Morrow. I want to welcome you to this special edition of SWI. It's our first broadcast of the new year and our chance to sit down with the Governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards. Congratulations, Governor, on your re-election. You. Um, we are now just days away from your second term officially beginning. And uh, throughout the campaign, you talked about your agenda, what you plan to do. Here we are. Let's start there. Well, first of all, thank you. And I appreciate this opportunity. And um, the inauguration takes place in about 10 days on January the 13th, and I'm excited about it. And quite frankly, uh, you know, what we're going to do in the second term is exactly what I talked about during the campaign. We're going to maintain the momentum that we currently have as it relates to economic development and job creation and try to accelerate that so that we have the stability that we need in our budget to invest in our critical priorities. You know, we, we're not yet at the southern average in terms of pay for our teachers. That is a huge priority of mine, and we're going to do that over the next couple of three years as we are able uh, to invest more in K-12 through education. Uh, for the first time in 10 years, the current budget had a net increase in investment in higher education. Certainly we have to continue that, especially given the master plan for higher ed that we have in Louisiana now uh, that was advanced by the Board of Regents under the leadership of Commissioner Kim Hunter-Reed, whereby we want and will have 60% of our working age adults with a post-secondary credential or degree by 2030. That's going to transform our state, and so we know we have to invest what is necessary to make that happen. And then my number one priority for new investments in education in the second term will be early childhood education, something that I think enjoys broad bipartisan support, and not just support here in this building and in, in the legislature, uh, but the business community, uh, other education stakeholders, uh, uh, all the advocacy organizations. And so this is the number one priority for us for new investment in education. But clearly we have to move forward on investments in infrastructure. That's going to be aided uh, by later this year uh, when we're going to be able to bond out $700 million uh, from the BP settlement to the state, none of which was to go to coastal restoration and protection. It was all for the state's uh, out-of-pocket expenses associated with responding to that spill. But that $700 million will represent the largest new investment in transportation infrastructure in 30 years. Uh, and that'll be on top of our ordinary uh, highway priority program, for example. Uh, so that's critically important, but I don't pretend that that's enough. Uh, we have huge infrastructure challenges and needs all across the state of Louisiana, whether you look at the uh, new bridge needed uh, in Lake Charles on I-10, the new bridge needed on I-10 here in Baton Rouge, uh, critically important. We have other uh, issues in, in North Louisiana, for example, the inner city connector on I-49 through uh, Shreveport. We still have to get I-49 South completed from Lafayette down to New Orleans. So we have, we have big challenges. Uh, but I'm looking forward to working with the legislature to finding ways to address those. And then clearly we need to make sure that we maintain the momentum we have behind the Medicaid expansion uh, that is afforded 460,000 working poor people with health insurance, saved the state money. We haven't lost any hospitals, uh, but most importantly, it's saving lives. And we have to make sure that, that we continue to uh, ensure the program integrity uh, there, but while maximizing all the benefits to the state of Louisiana. Uh, so we, we've, got, we've got no shortage of, of work to do over this term, uh, and I happen to be excited about it. And I'm, I know for a fact our state is much stronger and better today than it was four years ago, and I believe that four years from now that will also be the case, that we'll be even better and even stronger. And that is my wish, uh, not just for this new year in 2020, but for this new term. Well, Governor, let's talk a little bit about 
one of the things you mentioned there, and of course, uh, we can get into a lot of them, but infrastructure, and, and that bridge in particular that uh, needs to be built in the Baton Rouge area, how close is that to even being a reality of breaking the ground, knowing where it's going to be, and having some idea of when that thing could be ready to travel on? Yeah, I, obviously I can't tell you that we have a groundbreaking schedule. That, that, would, that would not be accurate. Um, but we know that it is the single highest priority for new infrastructure, but it also happens to be the most expensive project yep. uh, that we're talking about in the state of Louisiana today. Because in order to make it work, you don't just have to build the new bridge. You've got to connect it to I-10 in the west, I-10 on the east side of the river. But really to get the through traffic you need to make it feasible, you've got to connect it to I-12. So you're potentially talking about a $2 billion price tag here on this infrastructure project, which is huge. Um, and we have the same gas tax today that we had 30 years ago. Um, and it's 16 pennies a gallon. Uh, we can't ignore uh, that the erosion impact of inflation has whittled that 16 cents down to seven and a half cents of purchasing power. One of those pennies actually has to go to cost overruns on the time program, uh, which was put in the Constitution in 1988. So you literally have less than seven cents uh, of purchasing power uh, today relative to what you had uh, 30 years ago to do these projects. Do you now, see there being a possibility of that gas yeah. tax being raised? Well, whether it's a gas tax or other revenue measures or some combination, I do think it's possible. We now have the third oldest gas tax in the country. Um, last year, the states of Arkansas and Alabama uh, increase theirs uh, and, and we move from number five to number three. Uh, so it, it's something we're going to have to do obviously at some point. Uh, I am working with the legislative leadership to try to figure out what package uh, they can support. And remember uh, the session this year is a uh, or regular session that is non-fiscal. And so we can't take this up in this session anyway. But we are moving forward. We're working with the commission that was created by legislation sponsored by Senator Rick Ward. Uh, for example, uh, we have started uh, the work to, to figure out the, the most feasible place for a new bridge to be built uh, and, and, and that contract uh, has been awarded in consultation uh, with the commission that I, that I just spoke about that's headed up by Jay Campbell. So we are moving forward, but, but it is, I'm not prepared today to announce a specific timeline. I can tell you that it is a huge priority of ours, uh, but it's also the most expensive of the infrastructure projects that we're contemplating at the present. Well, your position has always been working together, partnership over partisanship. But as you come in this year, of course, uh, state usually thinks along party lines. The state works along party lines. Um, in fact, the legislature will be stacked against you. How will you get things done? You have a lot of projects you want to do, but how do you get everyone to play fair? Well, first of all, I, I don't accept the premise of the question that the legislature is stacked against me. I happen to believe that regardless of party, most people in the legislature are here to work in good faith to solve problems and move our state forward. Um, and that in the normal course of give and take, uh, that we can make that happen. We did it over the last four years. We solved the state's largest ever budget deficit and, and have achieved the stability that we've needed for a long time and, and actually started investing in our critical priorities again. Um, and, and I don't think that that's gonna be different in the second term. I've had an opportunity now to meet with just about all of the new legislators. I know all of the old ones. Uh, and I believe we're going to work together in good faith. Um, what, what my biggest concern would be is that you have too many of the legislators who really, um, you know, they're going to engage uh, in obstructionism and call it independence. Uh, really, we need to do better than that. And, and in, in my conversations with leadership, uh, and with individual legislators, I believe we are going to do better than that. And we're going to be able to work together and move our state forward. Uh, and I know it sounds cliche, but it's by being a Louisianan first and not being a Democrat or a Republican first, but being a Louisianan first. You know, hyperpartisanship is what has gripped Washington, D.C. Uh, and has caused so much dysfunction and distrust there. We should never let that take root here in Louisiana. Uh, we're better than that. Uh, we have traditions here in the way that we govern ourselves that I think work uh, much better here than anything we see coming out of Washington. And my commitment is to continue to work with everybody, regardless of party, who wants to sit down and work with me in good faith 
uh, have a good constructive dialogue, not to agree with me, uh, but to let's figure out where we can agree and where we disagree, I, if we will work hard enough, we can f find a compromise to move our state forward, and but we're you, gonna do that. But you talked about the concern. Yeah. There is a concern Sure. There. Yeah, there, there is concern because we saw some of that um, over the fir first four years. Um, but at the same time, we don't have that huge budget problem uh, hanging over us that required multiple two-thirds votes to uh, remedy. And so I, I don't see us being gripped by hyper-partisanship unless it's something that some people just actively seek uh, to do. Uh, we, we don't have to let that uh, you know, paralyze the, the state of Louisiana. And I don't think it will. I, I really am very optimistic as we go into this term that I'll be able to work with this legislature, rank and file and leadership uh, to address the biggest challenges that we have in the state of Louisiana. Uh, our future is very, very bright. And I've never been more optimistic about the future of Louisiana than I am right now. Governor, for a moment, let's go back to what sure. uh, brings us here today. <laughs> and that is a really tough battle, a grueling election, was, a race yeah. that you won by 40,000 votes, uh, but you got across the finish line in first place. Let's discuss that race just a bit. Well, it, as you noted in the question, it. it was a very tough race and we expected it would be tough um, and, and quite frankly if, if you will recall my opponent uh, really tried to nationalize the race um, and, and brought in the president on three occasions but talked about issues that really are not in part and parcel of what the governor of Louisiana uh, has any responsibility for and uh, that was because I believe we had enough accomplishments in the first term where we moved our state forward, we addressed that budget deficit, we gave teachers the first pay raise in 10 years, we started investing in higher education again. 460,000 people had health insurance who didn't have it before. We did comprehensive criminal justice reform that saved money and made us safer. So the issues that we had been tackling here in Louisiana were not ones that he could successfully run on and so they nationalized the race. That gave him his best chance to win. Um, but ultimately the race uh, was was pretty nasty it turned negative um, and and a lot of money was spent uh, on television commercials and other forms of communication uh, but that's all in the past now uh, the president even called uh, on the Monday after the election and we had a very nice conversation um, and uh, you know he had made three trips uh, into the state to campaign against me uh, and quite fr frankly said some outlandish things that were, were totally false. And yeah, I'm not funny how that works out. Yeah, right? I, I'm not sure where, <laughs> where he got his information from, uh, but at the end of the day, I promised the people that, that there was a time for, for politics, there's a political season, and then as soon as it's over, then you go back to governing. And, and I assured the president in that phone call uh, that, that it was time to govern again and that I was gonna resume the good working relationship that I had had with him and his administration over the previous three years. And by the way, that's what he indicated to me that he wanted to do as well. So I'm looking forward to continuing to work with him and his administration, with, with Congress, uh, to move our state forward. I can't be the best governor that I can be if I don't have a good working relationship with the president. And that's true regardless of who the president is or what party he or she comes from. I had a great working relationship with President Obama in my first year uh, as governor. Uh, so that's gonna continue, the, the, the election is behind us. I'm very gratified that the people of Louisiana saw fit uh, to give uh, me and my administration another four years to continue to move our state forward. I'm also gratified that they didn't reward a candidate who chose to run for governor of Louisiana by running against the city of New Orleans. I mean, he, he literally ran against New Orleans, and I don't think you should ever want to be governor and not want to be the governor of the entire state and promote the entire state and so forth. Um, so so I'm, I'm very happy with the way that it ended, uh, not surprised, but gratified. Sure. Uh, and, 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 I, and I accept that, that the people of Louisiana want us to continue to move forward the way we have over the first four years. And they want me to continue to be very bipartisan in my approach to being governor. And that's exactly what I intend to do. Let's talk though about some of that nastiness. Does it trouble you that it got so nasty that the president would fly in three times that the, uh, such outlandish things would be said and millions and millions of dollars were spent like in the last six weeks of the campaign? 
Well, you know, we expected him to come in. I mean, he's been doing that since he's been president. And so certainly him coming in once, twice, three times, that, that wasn't the problem. The problem was whoever gave him the information that he was speaking from just, you know, just gave him a lot of false information. Uh, and he, he used it. You know, I don't know of a single policy difference between mis myself and the president as it relates to the Second Amendment, for example. But he attacked me on the Second Amendment. Um, you all know that I'm a pro-life governor. I've signed some of the most um, uh, pro-life uh, legislation in, in the United States of America since I've been governor, but also have a 100% voting record as a legislator on that. And for him to come in and, and to totally distort and misrepresent what that record was, I'm assuming somebody gave him that information. So it, it's unfortunate that that happened. But at the end of the day, the people of Louisiana knew better. And that's evidenced by the fact uh, that they voted uh, to reelect me despite all of those visits. I will tell you the, the things that were most disappointing to me is there were ads that were run that contained zero truth. I mean, not a single bit of truth uh, in them and, and, and they were run uh, heavily uh, with, with big media buys and, and so forth. Uh, there were four separate ads run against me that had to be taken down because they were false. I don't know that that has ever happened in another campaign for governor anywhere in the country, anytime. Third party uh, ads? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, uh, I think they were all third party ads. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about it, I, I don't believe that any were run by a, by a candidate's mm -hmm. campaign, but still four separate ads had to be taken down because they were false. Um, and, and, I, and I hope and believe that the people of Louisiana, as soon as they saw how ridiculous and over the top they were, that they knew that they were false. Uh, but but it's still it's an indicator of just just how bad uh, the environment can be in, in politics these days. Yeah, the super PAC involvement is great, of course. And politics, uh, when you get down to it, is politics sometimes, and it's not always uh, uh, really the correct message that's, that's going to come out. Yeah, but but you know, I, I think some people believe that the end justifies the means, uh, and and they they have that philosophy, and they're willing to say do anything. Uh, in order to win. Um, I am not one of those people. I believe that you can win by being honest with people, uh, by running on your record, and by, by espousing a vision uh, that appeals to the people of Louisiana. Uh, and and that's, that's what we did, and, and I'm, I'm very thankful that we were successful. Um, but it appears that, that not just in Louisiana, but around the country and in national politics, uh, there are many people who believe that the end justifies the means uh, and they're willing to engage in just about any, uh, they will say anything yeah, and, sure. and do anything in order to win. Governor, let's touch on economics for a moment and, and also how cybersecurity can factor into Louisiana's economic future. Big cyber attacks recently on the OMV, on the state, um, really shutting down the process there in, in one of the busiest places where uh, businesses exchange in the state. So. Uh, how moving forward can Louisiana perhaps take this opportunity to become a national leader in cybersecurity and that be a job creating force going yeah. forward? Well, it's a great question and, and we've had several meetings of the Cybersecurity Commission that I created over the last several weeks to figure out what lessons we've learned from the attacks, how we can better uh, implement best practices from around the country and what we can do to encourage the private sector and public agencies to get themselves in a better posture to withstand these attacks so that they are not successful. So on the Sunday morning after the election, uh, we were attacked with ransomware uh, in the state of Louisiana. Uh, the good news is that we have 5,000 servers, all of which were attacked, only 250 were actually penetrated. We were able to shut that down before there was widespread damage. We did not pay a ransom. We did not lose data that had not been um, copied and backed up. And we were able to restore all of our systems. It still created a, a problem that lasted for a couple of weeks and, and inconvenienced a lot of people in Louisiana, principally with the Office of Motor Vehicles. But we actually have been recognized by the federal government and by our sister states as having uh, taken action years ago that put ourselves in a better position uh, to deal with these sorts of things. So for example, we created the Cybersecurity Commission that I just mentioned. Uh, we have the Emergency Support uh, Function 17 that we added uh, to the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Protection 
uh, to make sure that we're better dealing with these, these attacks. Uh, we've got the academic community, all of our universities uh, working together with the private sector because we have CenturyLink and IBM and so many others operating here in Louisiana uh, and in concert with the National Guard and the folks up at the Cyber Innovation Center in Bossier, for example. So we really have some of the best people uh, in the United States of America working with us. Uh, and so when other states get attacked, they call Louisiana to find out what we are doing to respond to attacks, to make sure that the computer uh, servers are, are protected and re-imaged, uh, the computers are re-imaged quickly, but also what we're doing to, to make sure that we are uh, prepared uh, for, for those things to begin with and, and putting ourselves in a posture so that those attacks are not successful. And this is the new normal. Yeah, it is. This is going to continue and it's going to become more frequent, not less frequent. And by the way, it's hitting the, the private sector too. But quite often the private sector won't tell us if they get hit because they don't want their customers and they don't want their competition to know that they've been hit. So in many cases, they're paying the ransom, getting their, their data back, and then they take additional action to try to prevent it from happening again. But quite often this will happen and we will never know uh, that it happened. Uh, but, but in any event, this is something we are intentionally focused on. We're putting the resources behind it and we're trying to better protect the state, both from a public perspective and we're working with the private sector to try to get them, and, and by the way, we have plenty of federal partners at the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and I, I speak personally uh, with these people frequently about what's happening here in Louisiana and around the country. Can we talk about, go back a little bit, talk about a water infrastructure issue in the state? A lot of rural areas have water systems over 50 years old, and they basically are struggling to get clean water to the residents there. Are we gonna work with that? I know there was a Senate Bill 170 that kind of put a uh, position, a, a committee in place to deal yeah. with that. Actually, what it did is it, it statutorily created a committee we had already put in place through executive order uh, so that we have all of the people that, that we can bring to bear to solve problems in, in one place at one time. And they surge on these communities and try to make sure we know the extent of the problem, how much it's gonna cost to fix it, what all the available resources are, and what we can do to make sure that when we build a new system, uh, and invest in it that we maintain it properly. Um, and and what th this is a problem that's happening around the country uh, and certainly it, it's impacted us here in Louisiana. As you mentioned, many of our smaller, more rural systems are decades old. They haven't been maintained properly. Uh, and so you end up with problems with the wells, with the treatment facilities and with the distribution lines. And any one of those problems uh, is significant. But if you put two or three of them together, uh, you can have a very, very expensive problem. And quite frankly, we can't go into every village in town and spend eight or $10 million. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out what all the sources of revenue are, whether it's USDA and whether those are low interest loans or whether they can be grants, uh, what we can do to help them through capital outlay, the community water enrichment fund program that we have uh, through LGAP, the local government assistance program. Uh, but we bring a DEQ uh, to bear, LDH, uh, GOSEP, uh, we work with the rural water folks across Louisiana. So we are working very hard to do better, but I'm the first to acknowledge this is a huge uh, issue for us. And, and one of the things we're going to have to do, and quite often locals don't want to do it, is we're going to have to consolidate the water systems so that not every small village uh, in town has their own. If they're in close proximity to one another, the one that is in the best shape has the capacity uh, to share water with, with their neighbor, uh, but, but they just have to be able to get along and do that, and, and, and we're gonna have to promote that going forward. Governor, a couple of things we wanna get in sure. before uh, we, we finish this, and, and one Natasha will talk to you about in just a second, but you know, you've been a governor who's been enormously popular uh, with the people of Louisiana, and, and we feel like we know you, but what is it about you that maybe we don't know? Like, for example, what would be the perfect night out for you and your wife? Well, <laughs> the perfect night out for me is to go to Tiger Stadium on a Saturday <laughs> night and watch, been a good watch, year watch to LSU that. win. But I'm not going to say that that would be, Don Donna enjoys that, but I don't know that that's her <laughs> perfect one. Uh, Donna and I love spending time together, and quite frankly, we don't, we don't do that as often as you, you might think because our, our schedules 
a demand that we go to a lot of different functions you get all to ride across. That pickup truck? Well, actually, <laughs> we do now. That, that again, she rides in the truck with me because she knows how much I love it. <laughs> I don't know how much she loves it because. Because when I'm in that 1966 Chevrolet pickup <laughs> truck, I'm listening to old country music. And oh. that is, that's my favorite. It's not her favorite. But we do love to spend time <laughs> that together. That leads into uh, something she's <laughs> going to talk to you so, about. So, so I, I will tell you that, that what we've come to enjoy are the simple things. It's when we can spend an hour or two together um, at the governor's mansion. And it could be in the drawing room while she's playing the piano. Uh, you know, she's a music teacher. Or it could be sitting on our balcony watching the sunset over the Mississippi River uh, while, while she'll have a glass of wine and I'll, I'll have an old fashioned or something like that. <laughs> and, and we just get a chance, just the two of us, to sit and talk and, and enjoy one another's company. Uh, that, that really has become very, very special for She's us. She's got a brief ask quickly, about something so here. So we saw you perform on stage for the revamp of yes. the Louisiana Hayride. Yeah. And uh, I have to say that song sticks in my mind now. It wasn't a song I knew, <laughs> but I just see you singing it. <laughs> so if you had a chance at another life, in another life, would you be in Nashville on stage? Well, if I were a better singer, I would love it. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't kid myself. I really enjoy singing uh, country music, and I know almost all the old songs, and, and I, I have a lot of fun with that. But I don't pretend that I'm better than I am, and so it's more fun for me to sing than it would be enjoyable for you to listen. Uh, <laughs> uh, but if I were better, that would, that would be something that I would love to do. We know, Governor, at the inauguration, perhaps, you can just grab the mic well, and we'll, just let one song <laughs> rip, right? Well, well, we'll see. I suspect Donna would overrule that. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll, I, I did enjoy that day at, at the Hayride. I, I will be honest with you. That was sort of a dream come true for me. That was, that was my favorite. A song, uh, it, He Stopped Loving Her Today, uh, that was obviously a George Jones song. Mm -hmm. And to do it on the Louisiana Hayride was very, very special for me. Great hey, venue. It was. Great to be with you. Thank you all so much. So Appreciate good to talk you. With you. Yeah, thank you, sir. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, whatever you want, with our brand new LPB app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB News, Public Affairs, and Louisiana programs you've come to love over the years. And please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.